Fixing your own iPhone screen display is actually pretty easy, but trying to fix your own iPhone screen display connector on the motherboard is not. This is an iPhone 13 that we're gonna repair in today's video. It has a destroyed display connector, and this happened during a DIY screen repair attempt. This is a micro soldering job that just not anyone can do. So if you need this repair, reach out to me through my website, which I will link down below to get a quote. And if you're a technician who can micro solder, get yourself this shirt, which I'll actually be sharing a 5% off promo code somewhere in the video. So make sure you stick around till the end. So let's go ahead and get started with the video. So first thing we want to do is do a visual inspection of the actual damage, which seems to be pretty bad. You know, one of the things that happens when you're an inexperienced technician is that you don't check to see if the connector is aligned and you just press down and, and like it doesn't click. So you just keep pressing down and end up damaging like this. So there's not much you can do other than replacing the whole connector so that the device is functional after. So let's look at the rest of the board, make sure nothing else is damaged, which looks to be okay. And this is an iPhone 13, the base model. Uh, everything else looks good. I'm surprised there are no other connectors. Sometimes you'll get multiple connectors that get smashed, but this one seems to be isolated to just the display. You know, some people call it the LCD connector, which is not an LCD device. So what we're gonna do is actually get the connector from this extension flex. So I bought this from Mobile Centrix. They sell an extension flex for testing and it's for 13 and 13 mini, which I guess that means that they use the same uh, screen connector but you can see on one side is the same connector and then on this side is the same as the screen. So if you ever run into a situation where you need a connector but can't find the connector by itself, sometimes you can get lucky finding parts that use the exact same part like this one. Obviously the display connector and it should have the exact same connector. So it's always important to double check that because I was actually gonna repair this earlier this week, it turns out I didn't have a donor board to pull it from, and now here we are. I was able to find this flex cable to uh, source the part. So what I'm gonna do is actually use my board holder. Let's just use this side. This is the Mi Jing something. I, f I forget the number, the, the actual uh, model number was somewhere around here that just fell apart. But it's a really good board holder. I like it because it can pretty much hold anything. You know, we gotta hold the board in place because that way it doesn't move around. So the first thing you gotta do is, I'm actually gonna warm up the board a little bit so we can spread a little bit of flux onto the board. When you apply it while it's cold, the flux just stays as a giant blob. Whereas when you warm it up, it actually helps spread a lot easier. Now one thing about this model is this is a sandwich board, but the 13 series actually use a really high temperature for uh, the sandwich. So you can actually work on the sandwich top board without really uh, compromising the sandwich itself. So we're gonna go through the whole process and we'll test at the end to see if there's any uh, sandwich issues like no service, no Wi-Fi, you know, whatever how much issues can occur. So as you can see, I've applied the flux. Now I was able to apply it and it evenly spread. So first I'm gonna try 380 Celsius and 45% air on my Anon hot air station, which I'll be linking to all my tools uh, down below in the video description. So if you ever are looking to get started with micro soldering and need to know what tools to get, I link all my recommended tools. Also, it does look like the underfill on these components is pretty close to the connector, so I am going to uh, kind of run my tool to make sure to separate it. And then one of the things I like to do is grab the connector at the end and see if I can pick it up. Oh, 
And here it comes. You can see the right side is loose. The left side is... Come on. Almost there. Oh. Alright, fill the parts, which is fine. Let's come back. Alright, there it goes. You want to take away the heat as soon as is desolder. You don't want, you don't want to apply additional heat when it's unnecessary. Now, if you're new to micro soldering, uh, you might be you might experience what is called floating these small components. Essentially, these components are are covered in uh, what is called like underfill and if you apply too much heat, the components come loose underneath that underfill and then this becomes uh, a nightmare situation. But with enough experience, you don't have to do that. Uh, so I have enough experience, so I'm not going to... Let me turn on my fume extractor. It's always <laughs> too late by the time I turn on my fume extractor. But yeah, with enough experience, then you don't have to do it. So that's what I'm doing here. If you're new, I highly recommend to clear out all the underfill around here first before you apply any hot air. Now I do feel the board is kind of wobbling, so let me tighten it a little more. All right, so let's clean up with isopropyl alcohol, see what we're left with. And then with my cotton swab, And then, all right, so this is, by the way, I, I tin the pads on the board. That way they have lower temp solder. So it's a lot easier to solder the new connector. And everything looks good. No rip pads. Uh, plenty of, well, there's a little underfill here, which we can probably clear out. Seem like, oops, seem like a little too close to the connector. So clear out whatever looks too close that maybe not necessary. All right, so a trick to doing these um, FPCs the hardest part is getting the replacement connector to sit flat and connect to all the pins. And the trick for that is actually wick away the, the ends, the ground pads. They tend to have like a lot more solder and a lot like fatter. So they elevate the connector at the ends and then the, the middle part is barely touching the pin. So if you leave these until the end to solder, then the connector is sitting on all the pins versus the large mounds here at the end. So I'm going to use some hot air and wick to flatten out these ground pads. I don't know if the left side is ground, but I don't know. The, basically the ends, whether they're ground or not, they're still really large pads. And I do leave just a little bit on the pads so that there's still something to solder onto, but I don't wick them out 100%. I would say a good 95%. Uh, you know, some do go are gone 100%. That's still fine. But you can see how this one is fully flat. This one's like a tiny little mound. Same over here is a little bit. Now, also another thing is the ground pads uh, on here. You can see right away how like these ground pins are kind of weird. And I know they're ground because you can see the trace of it. And it, it kind of, the outline just goes out to the middle, to, to, to the plane, the ground plane. Whereas these are isolated kind of little islands of pads or connections. Like these, you can see the traces. This is the pad that goes with the rest of the board. So those also have caused problems. So what I do is 
We always want to use flux. Now I'm going to turn down my air a little bit. Let me do 330. Essentially, hot air and with my iron just kind of go like this. Essentially try to flatten it out with my iron as best I can. Because the ground pads are the last, the ground pads are the last ones to melt when you're trying to put on a connector. So they become, they can become a problem. So let me add flux. And all the pads now look even. I don't know if you guys can see, but all the pads look even. This is my polarizer light, which gets rid of the glare, but also kind of turns everything dark. All right, so now let's source the display connector from this flex cable. Now, uh, there's many ways to do this, but I am going to first center it on the screen here. All right, get some Kapton tape. Now, Kapton tape is great for micro soldering jobs because it's heat resistant in that it doesn't shrivel away when it gets hit by and it gets uh, hit by heat versus regular tape, which will just burn away and get disintegrated. This one is high temperature heat. So you can use it to tape stuff down. Now I do see a lot of people who use Kapton tape to cover components thinking it act, it's gonna act like some sort of heat shield or heat sink, which it does not. So don't, don't Kapton tape everything surrounding the board, like an IC that you're trying to remove, thinking that the tape is actually preventing the heat from getting onto whatever. Now heat does go through it, but the tape doesn't fall apart when you heat it. All right, so I applied some flux. Now I do have two of these, just in case I mess up one of them. And since it's a flex, the thermal mass on this is really low, so I don't need that much temperature to get this to come off. So I'm using still 330 Celsius, 25 air. You know, the, the heat does not get sucked away um, by anything, really. The flex is really thin, there's no thermal mass. So, so anything on flex is uh, desoldered real easy versus on a board. All right, I didn't show you the trick. So the trick is when you see all the solder melted, you move it, move it out, and pull away your hot air instantly. Don't keep applying hot air while you've lifted it from, from here because the thermal mass has disconnected and this thing will disintegrate if you're holding it and hitting it with hot air. So as soon as you see it's molten, like move your hand, pull your hand away, and then move this out of the way. That way it cools down instantly, and you can see it's this very straight connector, it's not warped. The more heat, the more it warps. You know what, I'm just gonna leave that there. It doesn't really matter. All right, so now we come back here. Now let's, let's inspect. All right, this looks all good. Right, the FPC looks good. Now be careful with these FPCs. If you push those pins, they can pop out or break or something. So don't uh, push on them. Also don't recommend, if you got a new one, I don't recommend you pretend these pins because they will fall apart. All right, so now let's align it. So we gotta basically get this pin lined up with this first pin. So let's do it by actually pushing this other side to the right. All 
All right, so now I see this pin here is aligned. I don't know if you guys can see that. The pin here is aligned to the pad, and this pin here is aligned to that pad. And I should, well, it should be a little lower, but being that if I touch it, it might misalign a lot more. Um, I'm just gonna leave it for now and I can adjust it later. So one of the tricks to FPCs is you gotta start, well actually the, the flux kind of went away, so let me add more. Now the flux is oozing out of my needle here, syringe. Crap, I moved it. All right, oh well, screw it. I'll fix it again. All right. Make sure you are aligned. It's very easy to misalign. All right, it's kind of aligned. All right, let's give it another try. Now make sure you use plenty of flux because this is what keeps the connector in place. And look at the bottom left camera. See how far away I am? You want to start far and essentially just kind of warm up the board at first. The connector might move, but you can, you should be able to push, push it into play, back into place pretty easily. I need to keep in mind what you guys see, because what I see through my eyes is slightly zoomed out a little, a little more out. Essentially, you want to heat evenly by moving back and forth. Never keep your hot air in one spot because that's when you can warp the connector. You can burn it. Essentially, I'm just going in circles. And being that we added our own solder. Oh, look, it's soldering on now. Being that we added our own solder, which was... 183 Celsius versus the factory 220. I always forget 219, 220-ish. All right, I'm gonna bump it so it gets a little more aligned. And now I'm gonna increase the temp to make sure every pad flows. I do see some pads are still kind of struggling to melt. All right, I think it's good now. Let's go back and forth, back and forth. And visually, I can see all the pins look good. Pull away your heat and just wait. Give it maybe 10 seconds before you even try touching it. All right, I think that was 10, I don't know. But I can start out with some ISO and then toothbrush. And then my little hand pump. You drip and you... All right, this is not gonna sound right, but you drip and then you blow the ISO away. That way the, you give it a second for the ISO to absorb the flux and then you blow it away. So the flux and ISO combo kind of, uh, go away together, which is also kind of weird to say. All right, so now let's visually inspect the connector by looking at it from the side. All right, so visually it looks good. Now one thing we can do, if you're not sure or you're having issues, you might have to go in one by one and Poke each pin. Essentially, check. Oh, some kind of moves, but I don't know. Oh yeah, see this pin here, wiggled. That one's bad. I have several pins on this side that didn't make it, like in the middle, and it could be the minor warpage of the connector. 
I didn't say it was going to be perfect, but it could have been worse. All right, and then on this side, is up all good. All right, so this side is good. This top side is bad. So I have a few options. I could try to just solder with my iron, which actually I think I'm gonna try first. The thing that sucks is that I gotta, for the best results, I gotta try to do this at an angle. So I'm gonna put, uh, let's, no, that's too tall. What can I put? Maybe I can put this donor board here. I could also put it on the board holder and then tilt that by putting something underneath. I don't know. Let me heat this up. So I could apply flux and I can just go to that spot. All right, let me swap out my tip to a conical tip. This is a pointy tip, which is ideal for these type of jobs. And I'm using the Action T3B soldering iron with a genuine JBC tip. I will link to this tip uh, in the video description as well, just in case anyone's interested in it. All right, so I don't remember which pin, so I'll just do all of them. Now this is tricky because you don't want, I'll just hold the board with my hand. You don't want to burn the connector. Although if you burn the sides, it's not a big deal because as long as the pins are making contact. And I don't know if this is doing anything. Now I didn't tin my, oops, I was out of view. Sorry about that. Let me add some solder to my iron. It's very uh, hard to reach spots. Essentially apply heat to the pad and the pin and hope that the solder flows to both of them together. And it looks like the underfill on these surrounding components is working to my advantage. So good thing I didn't clear out all of that. I know for sure it was like that middle section, which I'm trying to focus on. All right, let's take a look a little closer. Let's check again. That's good, that's good. Might be hard for you guys to see. Try my best to keep it in focus. It's just a little awkward. Oh, that one's still loose. Yeah, okay, so not many, like two, two of them already looked like it didn't work. So let's go to plan B. Which is essentially Try to reflow it, and I'm gonna try to focus it just on this side. I could potentially also push the connector down. We still have flux there, so that's good.
And essentially we're trying to look at the pins here, see if it looks like they soldered on. And you can see I'm just constantly moving. I'm not uh, concentrating here in one spot. Right, you know what? I'm going to push down the connector just slightly in hopes that it's enough to push the pins to make contact. I don't know if you guys saw that, I was a little concentrating. <laughs> I was con concentrating a lot on the actual soldering. So, I hope you guys saw what I was doing. I think this might be a little better this time. Let's see. The way the board is a little hot, but I'm holding it with my fingers. I'm burning my fingers. I will say it's not the best looking solder joints, but as long as they work. Yeah, all the previous pins that were loose are no longer loose. I poked each one. And one thing to consider is that the pad is not just the end of the pin, the pad, the, the connector itself is a little well here let me show you like this side the part that i ripped off so although we can only see although we can only see like the end of the pin on the pad there's still this whole section right here that could be soldered on underneath so even though on the outside it might look like it's not soldered you know the base of it might be soldered to the pad so as long as the pin doesn't move when you poke it then you know it should be good all right so this is what a fixed fpc looks like and if you look to the side of the sandwich there's no gaps or separation it looks like a, a little bit on that side but it might be minimal that it doesn't affect anything so let's go ahead and test this out now one thing is anytime we're doing an fpc connector replacement check the the connector on the other end because if you're trying to use the exact same parts like for example this was a display connector check the display that you're going to be plugging in because sometimes people try to use the same part thinking that it's just a connector on the board but this side could also be damaged but this is actually a replacement, so it's good, but it's something I wanted to mention. One of the key things to look for when doing an FPC replacement is, you know, these connectors, when you click them in, they click. Like you feel that, that click feeling. So make sure you feel that here. So I'm going to line it up. I don't know if you guys caught that, but it definitely clicked really loud. All right, and then the top flex. All right, so now we're gonna use the PowerZ USB meter. So at the top, you'll see a green number that says 0 0.0004 amps. And at that number, that's the current draw to USB. And that kind of tells us whether the device is charging and working. Right now it's stuck at 0.1. Oh, there it goes. Oh, look at that. Uh, we got a Apple logo. And then keep an eye on the green number, the amps, that tells us if the device is charging. Oh, is it blue looping? Hold on, did I plug in the battery? Oh, okay. So, I forgot to plug in the battery. Okay, yeah, that would do it. So that's what... It <laughs> 
a charging current looks like when a battery is unplugged. All right, so now let's plug it in again. And you can see the current draw is actually slightly different. The numbers are actually bigger this time. And look at that, we have a low battery logo. And you can see the current draw is at 0.45, which should jump up over one amp here shortly. Especially if the battery's been dead for a while, it'll take a while before it charges properly. So you can see it's at 0.5. There you go, 1.5. So let's give this a few minutes to charge up and turn on so we can fully test it, make sure touch works and the whole phone works that there's no baseband issues. All right, so the device has booted. You can see the display is working, touch works. Uh, let's see, it has Verizon 5G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth working. All right, so it did have night mode or night shift on, so it was hard to see uh, the screen itself, but yeah, you know, brightness works. So definitely a fixed device. We're good to go. Also, if you want 5% off my merch like this t-shirt, use the promo code FPC5, which I'll show here on the screen. So you can get 5% off your order for whether you want a t-shirt, a sweater, a mug, support the channel and get yourself some merch. So what do you guys think? Was that a difficult repair? Do you have trouble with FPCs? I know I sometimes have trouble with FPCs. As you saw here, it wasn't just solder on, that, that's it. I did have to do a little bit of rework, but we got it working and very excited to get this phone up and running and ready for the customer. So make sure you guys check out the links down below in the video description, because I link to a lot of cool stuff like my websites, my locals communities. So if you want to support the channel, that's another way. I post a lot of information on there on the devices I'm repairing and I'll post pictures, videos, full in-depth step-by-step -step of kind of what I did to solve it. So it's a really cool place and it is free to watch. And if you want to be able to comment, it does require a $5 a month subscription, but you know, it's a way for you guys to support the channel. Also, if you are someone who can write repair guides for you know, iPhones, iPads, Samsungs, MacBooks, whatever, check out repair.wiki. This is a crowdsourced website where people are posting solutions and Lewis Rossman is looking for people to pay to create high quality guides. So reach out to me so we can get that set up. Uh, we're, we wanna pay you to, you know, capture diode mode readings, uh, put solutions to common problems for, you know, popular devices so that repair shops have a resource to go to to find solutions. That way we're not all just trying to guess how to solve stuff because if we all work together to solve these issues, we can grow as a, as a market. There'll be more repair shops, more money for all of us. So let's get this, uh, let's get this repair wiki, you know, fully loaded with solutions so we can all help each other out and let this industry thrive. So if you enjoyed the video, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel. And if you haven't already, Check out this video where I cover a Samsung FPC replacement, which is a really common issue. So if you want some more FPC repair videos, check that out. So appreciate all you guys who stuck around here till the end. I'll see you guys on the next one.